So Saturday, excuse me, Sunday night, Sunday night, not Saturday night, I jumped on the WrestleMania live stream with the Sports Fury, and it was seven and a half pissing hours long. WrestleMania, I love I love wrestling. I'm not the diehard wrestling fan I used to be, but I do still watch all the pay-per-views. I do keep an eye from a distance. I'll read up the analysis, uh, the after Raw, after SmackDown analysis stuff, whether that be Cultaholic or what culture wrestling or what have you. I'll still keep an eye on those, and I'll watch the clips if it's a segment that sounds of interest to me. Bleacher Report will always grade it after the show. I'll check those out from time to time. But I'm not a diehard fan. I still love it. But my heyday for wrestling for when it was like my obsession was probably from 97 until 05, early, early 06. So with that in mind, seven and a half hours is just too damn long, man. I get WrestleMania being a little longer than the average pay-per-view, but the average pay-per-view should be three hours and then WrestleMania should be four hours or in extreme cases, maybe four and a half. Seven and a half is too long. Like, you took the piss out of your own crowd three different times in this entire event. Uh, so they ran from MetLife Stadium. This was pretty much the day of the of the baby faces. I was trying to think about it. In terms of heel victories, we had Shane McMahon, although he still got his comeuppance. He did get away with the win. We had Baron Corbin over Kurt Angle. Those are the only two real heel wins I can think of. So you open the show. I'm going to skip over the pre-show. If you want the quick summary for that, uh, Tony Nese updates Buddy Murphy, or updates, upsets Buddy Murphy for the Cruiserweight Championship. Carmella shockingly wins the Women's Battle Royal instead of Sarah Logan, which would have been a much better, fresh pick. And then in the Men's Battle Royal, you had Braun Strowman last eliminating, I don't even remember his name, Jostel or something, or whatever, the white guy from SNL uh, of those two hosts they brought in. That was the last guy eliminated. Braun Strowman stands tall. That's pretty much the gist of what you need to know about the pre-show. Not a lot of interest. Yes, you had Ryder and Hawkins uh, upset the revival for the Raw Tag Team Championships. And yes, Kurt Hawkins ended his 269 match loss streak by getting a roll-up victory, playing possum after an outside-of-the-ring brain buster. He gets a roll-up victory after playing possum over the Revival, wins it for himself and Zack Ryder. Uh, I get the storytelling. I just wasn't that interested in the match, honestly. But, you know, it is what it is. So the main card opens up, and you got Seth Rollins versus... Uh, versus Brock Lesnar, and we're immediately starting off on one of the high notes. This was a shocking tone setter, and it was almost, although Paul Heyman striding out to the ring and basically saying, if we're not going on last, we're going on first because we've got better things to do, that was awesome, and it did kind of raise like a holy shit moment for you. But at the same time, it kind of robbed a lot of that excitement I felt uh, about the match itself because I immediately thought to myself, this isn't going to start us out with a 20-minute battle. Brock Lesnar's not even that great at those. You can get good matches out of Brock if you give him a Daniel Bryan, if you give him a Finn Balor, if you give him an AJ Styles. And I think Seth Rollins is capable of one of those matches. Perhaps part of it is Rollins, they're still trying to protect him just a little bit. And perhaps there really is the truth to the fact that it wasn't a match that was that high up on the card in terms of interest generated and Brock it wasn't that interested in it and with the stacked card you kind of just had to work with what you had so Brock Lesnar throws Seth Rollins around for about five six minutes and then Seth Rollins kicks Brock in the dick as soon as the ref falls out of the ring thanks to a not a painful bump but a bump that distracted the ref more so low blow super kick curb stomp curb stomp curb stomp one two three new champion uh, bleh. not a good match, not an exciting match at all. The right result, I'm happy with the result, but it's not a good tone setter for WrestleMania. And my immediate thought was, okay, they're starting us off on a high note as far as crowd being into it and being like, oh, okay, yeah, we got one of the results we wanted. To me, I looked at that and I said, well, 
they typically give you one, maybe two of the three happy developments you want. And so that was an immediate red flag because Brock maintaining the title, retaining, was one of the, I thought, more likely scenarios because that would free up Kofi and Becky Lynch. I digress. Uh, other standout matches, Shane versus uh, Miz in the street fight. Really false count anywhere, not a street fight. That was an okay match. Uh, the whole bit with Miz's dad getting involved and trying to fight Shane, that was, oh God, that was so cringe. So cringe. And it it is what it is. The high spot at the end with the superplex off the scaffold through the crash mat, even though they want you to believe it was through a wooden structure or whatever. Nice spot, and I actually like that they stuck with the finish. I thought they would because I pointed out to Josh and Sean that, wait a minute, look how they landed. Shane is technically on top. It's false count anywhere. Do your job, ref. And within three or four seconds of me saying it, the referee did take notice and count the pinfall. So Miz beats the snot out of Shane, but Shane comes away with the win. Good way to keep that going. I don't know if the feud, how much longer it's going to go, but at least it doesn't give Shane complete comeuppance. So now he's still going to walk around bragging that he's the best in the world and, you know, nonsense like that. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, it was a good, good enough match. I just wasn't that invested in it with regard to, with regard to the outcome. I didn't care, frankly, about the match. We pivot then, and let's see from there. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna scatter shot. So don't worry about chronological here. Uh, let's go into the Kurt Angle retirement match, which I believe was actually the second to last match. Baron Corbin versus Kurt Angle. It's not the match we wanted for Angle's farewell. Storyline-wise, narrative-wise, it did work because of their feuds and at times them being, you know, general manager and acting general manager and all that. There was something there. I got it, and it's a chance for Kurt to give the rub to a younger superstar on his way out. We know how this usually works. With the old veteran who's going away, basically looking up at the lights at the end of the match, that's what we got. It's not, we didn't feel like Corbin was deserving. We were begging for John Cena, who we knew was going to be there to be a bait and switch at the end, where Kurt would either squash Baron Corbin, or uh, basically Corbin would just be removed from the match right before it started. And that's not what we got. Even though st st uh, storyline-wise, there would have been a better narrative sense uh, in terms of coming full circle for Angle's career versus Cena's, we didn't get that moment. We get a very, very short, underwhelming match. Kurt, mostly in control, Goes for his moonsault late. Nearly lands on his damn head. That was not good rotation. And with his physical shape he's in, I was amazed he even attempted it. Because, yeah, he, he nearly killed himself, I thought. Baron Corbin picks him up. End of days. One, two, three. Corbin wins. Uh, crowd's not even upset. It's not even like Corbin got heat off of it. Corbin's had little to no momentum. Curtin has had little no to no momentum in the lead up to this. If anything, it just further reinforces that, yeah, Kurt, Kurt doesn't have any more. He is done. And I don't think Corbin really gets any benefit from this. I mean, it, it was so obvious to everyone that Kurt was pretty much done that all it is is just kind of like a, wow, that's how they're sending Kurt off? They're not going to do anything better than that? Kurt jumps on the mic after the match. He's not even winded. And he's basically saying, you know, well, it's not the outcome I wanted, but if you guys would uh, humor me, uh, I'd love to hear those two beautiful words to send me out. And they start playing his music and the crowd gives a, you know, at this point it's like, okay, well, we, we can do the best we can with this. And so the crowd gives Kurt, you know, his loud send off with the you suck chance according to his music. It, it was weird. It felt like it should have been so much bigger and better of a moment for him. Elsewhere, you have Elias jump on to do his performance. You have edited versions of him on the piano and drums, I want to say, as well as his in-ring uh, guitar playing. He does a little bit of White Stripes, Seven Nation Army. That was cool. Uh, I don't know if he's actually playing the other instruments, but that, that looks pretty cool. That was pretty talented there, I thought. He's interrupted because it's Elias in a performance, so of course he is. But he's interrupted by basic thugonomics John Cena circa 2002, 4, something like that. I mean, way, way retro John Cena. Cena comes out, full chain, full Yankees jersey and all that after this weird vignette thing. And, you know, 
seen as a Boston guy, so a little sacrilegious you'd think him wearing a Yankees jersey, but it is what it is. He comes out and shows, even in a PG era setting, he can definitely still still do a little bit of freestyle, still have great delivery with it. And he pretty much buried uh, Elias, and he even talked about that, getting out the golden shovel. I mean, very self, self-deprecating, self self-referential stuff. He took a shot at his own movies. He talked about the fabled John Cena heel turn, getting out his golden shovel to bury Elias. And he even referenced the AA instead as the FU, which I thought was an extra nice touch. Uh, so that's how the segment ends. Elias tries to attack Cena, uh, gets a five-knuckle shuffle, and then a FU to end the segment. Not a whole lot of substance, but it was entertaining. And for WrestleMania, and for a throwback sense, that works. It's also a good way to get Cena actually cheered for a change when he makes some kind of significant appearance like this. We didn't get an Undertaker match. But we did get pretty much every single championship belt that could change hands did change hands. Uh, The exception was Samoa Joe in record time. Coquina Clutch choking out Rey Mysterio. I mean, that that was the fastest squash match I've I've seen in some some time, for real. Uh, You also had matches with the women's tag team championships changing. The Iconics steal the win after Beth Phoenix hits Bailey with a glam slam from the top rope. That was pretty cool. Iconics come in, throw Phoenix out of the ring, and steal the victory, winning their first tag team championships. So at this point, the entire theory, illusion, whatever, of the four horsewomen holding the titles high at the end of the show, completely destroyed. Obviously, we knew with the winner-take-all main event that that was going to be the case, but now only one of them possibly could even still walk away with that distinction of having gold. So uh, not a whole lot to talk about in the women's tag team match. Some ugly botches early, a couple mistimed things, but, you know, nothing nothing egregious. I think Natalia and Beth Phoenix, they still look like they got a lot left in the tank. Obviously, Natalia hasn't stopped wrestling, but Beth Phoenix, you know, she was gone for several years, and now she comes back. I don't know if this was a one-time run or what, but... Uh, she's she still got it. She still got it, and that's a presence that's still not quite there in in the women's division right now. So very very impressive on her part. The match itself just kind of eh. Uh, let's see what's another match we got. Uh, I could dive next into Kofi Mania. Yeah, let's do that. We got Daniel Bryan taking on Kofi Kingston. The new Daniel Bryan taking on Kofi Kingston. Daniel Bryan in this match. Uh, Good heel heat. New Day's out there. Rowan is out there. Interesting, I thought that the babyface had two guys at ringside to help him instead of just one. All the New Day did was keep Rowan out of it, keep him from factoring into it. And this was a good match. It really was, and at the end, it felt like it built to a proper ending. Uh, you know, narratively, it came to a logical conclusion. You have Kofi basically blocking the LaBelle lock, grabbing hold of Daniel Bryan's arm, and then he's doing the head stomp thing that Daniel Bryan's been doing. All of that was just like, that was awesome. And then you have him hitting Trouble in Paradise for one, two, three. That's a perfect perfect way to conclude that I feel because it puts a fine bow on Kofi's story yeah now there are a couple issues but they're not with the match itself I didn't like that they had New Day bring out at ringside they had a had the old championship belt they had a sheet over it a cloth over it whatever you want to say but because there was a belt clearly a belt based on the shape of the package you knew okay They're indicating Kofi's going over because Daniel Bryan has already introduced a new belt. If we hadn't already gotten the vegan championship, that would have been a perfect heel time to do it. Um, But it is what it is. Uh, And then additionally, in the middle of the freaking match, WWE Shop.com released what was in the box Big E was carrying new Kofi Kingston merchandise uh, and, you know, riffing off the New Day's thing. And your new champion, and it's Kofi Kingston, it's the New Day, and it's the WWE Championship belt. Literally in the middle of their match, 
they spoil who is going to win. The two things combined kind of suck. They take you away from the moment, but whatever. The right conclusion happens. Kofi wins, wins clean, and his kids come out into the ring with him to celebrate. Best feel-good moment of the entire show. No questions asked. And being roughly in the middle of the show, it was able to not completely exhaust you before then. So it wasn't. It didn't suffer from some of the same problems the main event and later matches would. We also have Randy Orton versus AJ Styles. It was a good match. It wasn't anything amazing, I didn't think, but it was a good match. I thought that Randy was still going to go over, but no, it's AJ Styles. Uh, the noteworthy thing in this match is pretty much the production's crew has the lights botched, and they're pretty much blinding most all of the fans in attendance. Uh, we were trying to figure out, watching on the stream, Josh, Sean, and I were trying to figure out what is the crowd reacting to? Like they're looking around, they're reacting. Like we we assumed there was a beach ball in in the crowd at that point. No, they were reacting because they were pissed off about being blinded by the by these giant production lights, and they couldn't even really see what was happening in the ring. And the pop we heard later was about three quarters of the way through the match when they finally turned off those lights and people could actually see what was happening. So that's why they got a sudden. A sudden pop out of the crowd when you're looking in the ring and you're like, what the hell's happening? I thought someone was coming out or it was a beach ball or some some nonsense. AJ Styles, though, with the win. Phenomenal forearm gets the win. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. Randy Orton doesn't really have a whole lot of rub he needs at this point. AJ, this was his, I believe, third? Fourth WrestleMania. Fourth WrestleMania. Lost to Jericho. Beat Shane McMahon, beat Shinsuke, beat Randy Orton. So he's 3-1 and one at WrestleMania. Uh, not bad. Not bad for the uh, veteran. Still probably one of the best, if not the best, in-ring competitors in the world, AJ Styles. Uh, let's see here. What's another one to pivot to? SmackDown Championships, another retaining situation. The Usos retain their uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championships. I thought that was also the right call. Funny note, Ricochet and Aleister Black had, on Raw, a chance at the Raw Tag Team Championships. They lost. They had a chance then on NXT TakeOver, a chance at the NXT Championships. Lost. And then on WrestleMania, at WrestleMania, they had a chance for the SmackDown Championships and lost. Three tag team title matches. Now, in all three cases... I believe it was a multi a multi team event, and I don't think they ever had to eat the pen. But still interesting, I thought. How technically they had three matches for tag titles in about a four day span, five day span, I guess. Oh no, if it's Monday, then it'd be six. Whatever, a one week span, and they lost all three of those. I don't know. I think both guys are very talented. I just don't think narratively they know anything what to do with them right now. So hopefully that changes. Oh, I'm sure I'm missing some, but I've already been going 20 minutes on this. So let me uh, jump to the main event here. The main event itself, it, it was interesting. Charlotte Flair, I didn't know this at the time, but Charlotte Flair was recreating Ric Flair, her father, Ric Flair's entrance at, I believe, the Great American Bash was it 96 or 86? It was recreating a, a famous Ric Flair entrance where he you know, was lowered in on the helicopter, the champion coming in to defend. Nice touch, comes out down the red carpet. Uh, very, very nice touch. You then have the Ronda Rousey. It's interesting. I remember back in the day, you used to introduce the champion last. You introduced the challenger, and then the champion was last because it was like, I'm the champion, you you come on my time, basically. Now it's the opposite. Now the champion's the first one out, and the challenger is the last one out. Or, in this case, last ones. You have uh, Joan Jett, and you have Ronda Rousey's theme played live. Not not bad. Not, not terrible. But, you know, not bad. Uh, she comes out. Ronda Rousey does. She beams a smile for a second at Joan Jett, and then goes to just you know, her mean mug and look, but it was just so, it, it, it honestly made me laugh because you get this, you know, you get this look where she's like, huh. <laughs> like it, and just her power strut, it just came across as comical to me. 
um, in that situation. I'd rather her not have even acknowledged Joan Jett or maybe just don't flash the beaming smile because obviously they would have interacted behind the scenes prior to this. She could have just looked to her and given some kind of respectful nod or maybe even a point, and that would have been fine. That would have been it. Just leave it at that, but whatever. Rhonda comes out. Charlotte then comes out with her entrance. We, you know, She had the helicopter lowering, but nothing crazy beyond that. Maybe some extra fireworks for her entrance. And then Becky comes out last. They have the jets, uh, the steam jets going at the top of the stage when she's coming out, but nothing, nothing extravagant uh, like the others. The match itself, it was good. The finish, it sounds like, did not go according to plan. I don't doubt that it was always planned for Becky to win, and it should have been, but there were there were two or three holy shit moments in this match. Ronda took an ugly bump at one point. After she takes three power bombs at one point, uh, no, it wasn't off the power bombs. There's another moment where she gets like a basically a double arm bar on Becky and Charlotte as they're dangling her over the top. They were trying to, I guess, slam her out of the ring. And Rhonda's holding on. She's got the lock. Becky slips free. And then between Charlotte's legs, basically a sliding drop kick, hits Charlotte in the flat of the back. Or sorry, hits uh, Rhonda in the flat of the back. Rhonda flies out. But doesn't quite get far enough away from the apron. So she hits like right on like her her butt, basically. Her lower back butt area just flat on that hard edge of the apron and then gets dumped awkwardly onto her head. That was that was the biggest bump I think I've seen Ronda Rousey take since coming to WWE. Now, she's gotten the shit beat out of her with kendo sticks and chairs and crutches and things like that, but this was just such an awkward, dangerous bump where you were just like, oh! Uh, another moment came later in the match. Charlotte gets the figure four on Ronda. She's trying to bridge it to the figure eight. And out of camera, out of nowhere, Becky Lynch flies out with a leg drop on Charlotte to break up the submission. That was another awesome moment, too, just because, again, you don't see Becky, and then all of a sudden it's just Becky and her butt come flying into screen, and you're just like, oh, okay, sweet. Good match. Uh, I felt like it should have gone five minutes longer because the finish comes out of nowhere. Becky goes out of from the ring at one point grabs a table because it's a triple threat you can't have one person be disqualified and that determined the winner so it's basically no dq the only thing they did with that was the table becky brings the table into the ring sets it up and she sets it in the corner and they're trying to tease a charlotte spear through the table ultimately well this is after becky when she's first setting it up ronda rousey sees the crowd reacting and her continuing to shit on kayfabe and all that screams tables are for bitches and flips it over after the crowd had cheered the table being introduced to the match uh from there it gets set up in the corner they're trying to set up for a charlotte to presumably spear one or both becky and ronda through the table would have been an amazing spot instead they have both ronda and becky sidestep charlotte and kind of throw her into the table like flip her into the table but it doesn't really break right. Like it breaks, but not in any kind of satisfying way. Charlotte rolls out of the ring and she's removed from the last moments of this match. You then get the intense stare down between Becky and Ronda. Great storytelling to that point. Crowds cheering because they're feeling like, okay, here comes this big moment. Here it comes. Here's the knockdown drag out fight we've been wanting. And then you get this quick little succession of punch, 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 punch. Oh, there's the arm drag flip by Ronda. Oh, she's setting up for the Piper's Pit. And oh, Becky reversed to a pin. One, two, three? What? What? Like, yes, but what? The ending came out of nowhere. And like I said, this match felt like it needed another five minutes at least. And I, at the very least, would have tried to properly do the table spot. Maybe change up how you do it. But, ah, man. I'm thrilled with Becky winning. She unifies the Raw and Women's Tag Team Championships. She is now a dual champion. Becky Two Belts, as they're calling her. That's cool, and she deserved it. She has earned this moment. I fully I fully agree this match is and was the main event because of Becky's inclusion. If it was just Charlotte versus Ronda, I think it would have been probably the second-to-last match, and they would have had Kofi Bryan or something to that effect close it out. But 
Man, oh man. Ooh, that finish is so out of nowhere. There's question, uh, it, there are reports that it might have actually been botched. Not only do you see on the three count that Charlotte's shoulders, not Charlotte, uh, Ronda's shoulders are actually up off the mat. Not one shoulder, both shoulders actually go up before the three count. The referee, it sounds like, counted the three when that wasn't supposed to be a three count. But if that's the case, then it's curious why in years past when something like this happened, you would have the authority figure come out, be it Stephanie, Vince, Triple H, whoever. You would have an authority figure come out and restart the match or something to that effect. They let this stand. I, I When I saw it happen, other than the fact that it came out of nowhere and I felt like the match should have had another five minutes, I thought, okay, that's how they're protecting Ronda. Yes, they're giving you Becky going over on Ronda, but they're having controversy in the pin and therefore keeping Ronda pretty well protected at that point. That's what I assumed. And I was like, well, you know, it's better than Becky beating Charlotte, be it by the arm bar or the pin. So getting getting Ronda and doing it in a sneaky way, uh, kind of a tricky way, That that's, I thought, the best result. But I don't think that was what was intended. So that's what we got. We got to see what comes of it. But Becky Lynch closes out the show, the Raw and Women's Champion. Great, great finish um, as far as the results. Pretty much eight out of every ten baby faces won here. Only two champions retained. Every other belt changed hands. The, well, yeah, U.S. title was kept and SmackDown tag titles were kept. Raw tag titles changed. Uh, WWE and Universal titles changed, the women's title changed, the women's tag team titles changed. Just across the board, man, clean sweep. Uh, this was very much the, the night of the babyface, which we have not seen much in recent years.